Welcome, welcome to Living Word Worship Center Wednesday night Bible study. Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, welcome especially to our folks on the internet there. We appreciate you coming out <laughs> and being with us and being part of our group here. So I want to uh, want to begin with an announcement here. Uh, as you know, we uh, uh, our classes are every Wednesday from 7 to 8.15. Uh, instead of 8.30, we shortened it a little a few weeks ago, and I, I like it a lot better. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's a little easier to sit, too, through that uh, time period. It's easier here. It just feels better. But, all, but I want to point out especially the last two um, Wednesdays in December will be recessed during those two weeks, December 21st, is the Wednesday before Christmas, of course, and then the 28th is the one before New Year's or between. So there's two weeks. You could call it a winter break or or a school <laughs> school recess or whatever you want to call it. But uh, it'll be two Wednesday nights that we're not uh, in session here. Those two last last two weeks of the year. So if you don't mind, just uh, pass that around if you're uh, if you're in a place where that would matter. And uh, at this point, we're going to begin uh, with our prayer requests this evening, and I'll just call out the names and uh, ask, ask us all to agree together uh, in prayer for them. I want to begin with uh, my buddy Ken, Sportster Ken, <laughs> and for Robin Swalik, uh, for Greg and Ellen Stone, for Jim and Mary Roebuck, Tammy Rains, for William Drugalis, uh, he has he's struggling with lung issues and he was in the hospital and I talked with him I'm not sure William if you're still in the hospital or not, but uh, we're praying for you tonight also for Aaron Howes for Kathy Daly or boo-boo as she's known she had uh, I think she had a knee replacement didn't she wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and uh, so continue to remember that uh, also Michael St. Clair Tiffany Hermes Angela Hancock, the Paroli family, uh, Chuck and Ada Garza family. Chuck is uh, he's having some respiratory issues himself uh, since early this morning. He has um, he was having some oxygen issues and so forth. And he is in he's at Seaway. What was used? What was uh, Seaway Hospital? I think it's Beaumont now, or maybe it's changed again. I'm not sure the name of it. But uh, anyway, Chuck, uh, we're praying for you. Ada, praying for you. Just just uh, respiratory issues. He just needs to recover fully from that and quickly. Also, uh, Cheryl Miller, uh, we've been praying for her husband. He did, unfortunately, pass away. And also, uh, so you know, uh, Eugene Johnston's uh, mother passed away. And so let's remember uh, Eugene and Karen's family. Um, and I think that was today when that happened. Yeah. Well, it was definitely today. Also, uh, for Janet, Tyra, for Kip's mom, I think she had some issues with her back, maybe, or an injury there. Be sure and let her know that we're praying for her. I appreciate that. And uh, also for Greg, uh, it's uh, Mark's uh, stepdad, I think he said? Nep nephew? Okay, boy, I missed that. Uh, <laughs> it may be a, a ulcer issue or whatever. And also uh, for Bella and Cassandra, I guess they had car trouble and weren't able to make it, so hopefully they'll be here after that. So they're not sick, but they, they still need prayer. Your automobile needs prayer a lot. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so if you, I'm sure you can relate to that. So uh, let's all agree together, those of us here in the room and, at, and uh, who are viewing on Facebook. So let's pray for these folks. Our Father, it's such a privilege to be here and we're so happy and so glad and grateful to have this opportunity and have just a good place to come to and, and to have some time set aside to do the important work that really is about the people whom you love and whom we love. We ask you to minister by your power, by the Holy Spirit. We ask you to minister in the lives of everyone who has been mentioned and also those who are affected 
by these issues or situations or sickness or or, or uh, in mourning or whatever is going on in the name of Jesus we ask you to do what only you can do and what you live to do for your children we ask you also to bless those who are supportive of them in our prayers together with them and for all who are looking to you tonight we ask that our hearts be filled and overflowing and and just do the most you possibly can in the time that you have here this evening in us tonight and for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you and thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned uh, tonight, um, being the last week in, uh, last Wednesday in November, and then we have a couple of weeks to go in December and we'll be recessed for two weeks. Uh, so we have two lessons to go in this series and i want to pick up there and just quickly uh this series is a contrast or a comparison of time versus eternity and i just want to hasten to add again because we have a sort of a mindset in this which is not which probably is not accurate according to what we've understood in this teaching Eternity is not just a long, 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 long period of time that never ends. Eternity has nothing to do with time. Time has nothing to do with eternity. They are two completely different dimensions which have nothing to do with each other. Time is one thing. Eternity is another thing. So contrast, I think, is a better word than comparison. So our theme verses that we're using for this, and the first one is as good as you'll need, Isaiah 43, 13, from eternity to eternity, I am God. Or literally, he's saying I am eternity. God is eternity. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 3, 11, I love this verse, God has set eternity in the heart of every man. Now, by extension, God is eternity. If God is eternity, and eternity is in a seed form in every man, then every man has this, has this inner knowing in his heart of the reality in some way that God is real, whoever he is or whatever he is, however little or much they may know about him, there is a sense of something beyond in the heart of every person. And that, that sense is, is this eternity, this thing we call eternity. God has set eternity in the heart of every man. What that means is every man has in him eternity and is in fact an eternal being. Every man exists forever, period. Now, the difference that we've made in our teaching here uh, in this phrase eternal life is eternal life is to exist forever in God or in the family of God or as a Christian or however you want to define it. Eternal life in John 3.36 whoever believes in the Son of God has eternal life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. So every man has eternity in him, which means he can never die. Eternal life, which comes through the Son of God, Jesus Christ, means that that eternal life existence that he has will be spent with God in God's family as a believer in the blessing of God. So we have eternal existence for all men, eternal life for all who have been born again. Amen. Just think of it that way, okay? Now, just to, just to, just to stress another phrase, in this John 3.36, in another way I should say, whoever believes in the Lord, in the Son, has eternal life for having faith in Him. 
But also it's worth adding that believing in the existence of him is not the same thing necessarily as believing him, believing his word. There, you may say you believe in God. I ask you this, do you believe God? Do you believe what he says? Do you believe every word that comes from God? Not just do you believe in the existence of God. Okay, so we know that the five uh, uh, different parts of this study, uh, part one was the nature of God, then we studied the creation of man, spiritual rebirth or being born again, we looked at that, and then we just recently uh, almost finished up the spiritual versus the material or the temporary natural world versus the eternal spiritual dimension. And then the last uh, part of this teaching is called the ultimate satisfaction of man. We just got to that last week and we'll pick up there uh, tonight. So in review quickly, uh, this is really, really important. You should memorize this and carry it with you in the forefront of your thinking and your conversation. This will come up, I promise you. If you will hide this in your heart and memorize it, God will bring people across your path that you can help them with this simple thing. Believing in God does not make you a Christian. Even the demons believe in God and tremble. James 2.9 But believing in the Son of God does in fact make you a Christian. That is the definition of a Christian. John 3.36, we just read it. God is spirit. He is a spirit being. John 4.24, God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And yet, God who is spirit entered the physical, natural realm of time through the birth of his son, Jesus Christ. When Jesus was born in the flesh, God was in him. So God who is the eternal spirit was in Jesus, the son of Mary. So from the spiritual, he entered into the natural realm in his son. Man, mankind, every man, the natural man, I should say, was handmade. When I say handmade, I mean the hand of God dirt. formed from dirt. He made the human body that was named Adam so man was handmade by God personally from dirt and with his own inbreathed breath into this lifeless body. So man is made of clay and spirit. Handmade. The entire rest of the universe and every being, all other beings, were created, not made. They were created, there's a distinct difference. They were created simply by the spoken word of God. God did not just, he didn't just say, Adam be. He formed Adam with his own hands and then breathed life into it. But to the angels, he said, and to the planets, he said, and to the universe, he said, and to light, he said, let there be, and there was. He just spoke it into existence. He created it with the, literally with the words of his mouth. Psalm 33, 6, by the words of his mouth, the heavens were made. But nothing else was made like man. Man is unique. He was handmade. He was made personally by the hand of God. And nothing nor any other being was made in that way. To me, that's worth noting. So in the fall, the fall of man, we call it, uh, the spirit man in Adam's body, the man inside, there's a man inside of you, that's you. Your body is not you. You are a spirit who has a soul who lives in a body. But you are not a body, you have a body. 
So Adam had a body. The, the spirit man in Adam's body, Adam, the real man on the inside, died instantly when he disobeyed or rejected God as God said. In the day that you do, you'll surely die, and he surely did. He did. The spirit man, Adam, did. His body did not die for another about 900 years. Adam lived to be 930 years old altogether. Now, James says this in the New Testament, the body without the spirit is dead. Without the spirit, the body doesn't have long. You can bring people back sometimes. But you can't wait too long. In the beginning, before things had digressed to the state they are now, not to get into that whole scenario, but in this perfect world that had just been created and that had just been corrupted, there were, the physical body of Adam was able to linger and live on in the fallen state for around 900 years before he finally died. And then it became less and less and less and man died sooner and sooner and sooner as the trajectory uh, continued. But the body without the spirit is dead. The spirit can live without the body because the spirit has its own body. The spirit man in you is like a hand in a glove. It's you in spirit form. It's your ghost. Is that all right? It's your ghost. I want to say it that way. It's your spirit. In the King James, the word ghost is used for spirit many times. So you are you forever. Except in where you are now, you are not perfected outwardly, but you will be then. But you still will be you and you still will be you still will have the same identity that you were made with, born with created with, whatever you want to call it. You will be you forever. But the good news is you will be perfected forever. And what's more, so will everybody else. So now when you're in heaven, if you're having a problem with people, oh, you, there, there's something way off. With, if you can't get along with where everybody's perfect, then you really do have a problem. If you can't get along with God, tell me who you could get along with. God's perfect. But yet people fight God. They argue with God. They really play in God. And they're too silly to know it. So the, the body without the spirit is dead. James 2.26. Okay. When we're born again, when we're saved, when we become a Christian... When we be, first begin to follow Jesus, ever how you want to phrase that, when we're born again, our deadened spirit, or darkened, it's the same thing, is changed instantly. This is the reversal of the fall. In the fall, the spirit is dead immediately. When we're born again, the spirit is quickened immediately, or regenerated instantly. But our physical body won't be changed until the rapture or later resurrection or until the body dies and then there's a new body. 1 Corinthians 15, if you want to read that chapter. Every believer, when they die, no matter what, that moment, their spiritual body is them and the only thing that remains are your remains. The physical, natural dust of the earth remains. Um, it cannot live without the spirit, but the spirit does live on without the flesh. 
because there's a new body. Paul said in Corinthians, 1 first, first Corinthians 15, there, if there is a natural body, then there is a spiritual body. So is there a spiritual body? Is there a natural one? Then there is also a spiritual one. So, the rapture, of course, is considered or called the beginning of the first resurrection. The rapture is a resurrection, a real resurrection. Not just bringing back to life and dying again. You know the difference, right? There are several, there are several instances throughout the Bible where people died and were brought back, but they died again. Maybe some of you were dead and brought back. I don't know. I've seen it once. I thought twice, but I can't think of the other one right now. You'd think you wouldn't forget that, but this is the normal Christian life if you just, if you just are normal. So I've definitely seen it, but that person, I'm sure, will die again if they haven't already. But they were dead. I told you about it, about the lady getting, you know, hit in the car and all that. And the, M, the EM, EMT had already abandoned her, went back to the truck and so forth. And I asked, I asked if it'd be okay if I just went and prayed for her. And uh, they thought I was going to do like last rites or whatever. whatever. And say, well, yeah, sure, whatever, it can't hurt. So I just went over there. It was an Oldsmobile Cutlass. She was in the driver's seat. So I just opened the other door and got in and and uh, laid my hands on her and prayed for her, and she just rose up. She just rose up, so I just motioned to the guys in the truck. They're, they're back in the truck. It's about 100 feet over there. So here they come. And so I don't say anything. They don't say anything. I remember the clothes I was wearing. I remember everything. There's a lot more to that, too. There's the, I told you there's a little dog in the car and a whole bunch of stuff, then a little girl later. It's a long story, I won't take you, but, but this person was dead. Clinically dead, whatever you want to call it, dead. But they came back. But they weren't resurrected. They were just raised back from the dead. Temporarily, but they died again. Lazarus, Jesus raised from the dead, but he died again. But the resurrection is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he himself describes it as this, I am he who was alive and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore now, never to die again. So there's a difference in just bringing back people from the dead and resurrecting from the dead. Okay, I didn't mean to get stuck there. So new natural life begins, of course, when the male sperm is mixed with the female egg, that's biology 101, New spiritual life begins when the Word of God is mixed with faith. There's a conception there. There's a pregnancy, a spiritual pregnancy that occurs, if that helps you to remember. Hebrews 4.2 For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. We heard it and conceived. They heard it and walked away barren. The same gospel, what's the difference? We mixed it with faith, we believed it, they rejected it. The same gospel could have saved them all. It was up to them. When you reject it, you walk away barren. If you receive it, you walk away with new life every time. I won't go back and read this again, but this, the perfect example of this is with Mary, the mother of Jesus, in Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. When the angel came to her and said, you're going to conceive a child by the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and after she got over that for a moment, I guess, and collected herself, the angel said, told her every detail. You're going to name him, what he's going to do. He's going to be king of his kingdom. There'd be no end, and it's going to be your child. And when she concluded that conversation with these words, she said, 
according to your words, so be it unto me. So the word of God came to her in the angel Gabriel. And she believed that word. She mixed that word with faith. And when she mixed her faith, when she said, so be it unto me, I receive it. When she did, she became pregnant with Jesus. A spiritual conception occurred between her and the Holy Ghost when she mixed her faith with the Word of God, period. This is the whole gospel. If you can't buy this, you can be many things. You cannot be a Christian. You can be a Bible teacher. You can be a professor. You can be all these things, but you cannot be a child of God without believing in the Son of God. Okay, and that's exactly how we conceive Jesus. Conception, it's a conception. We believe what we heard. We receive Jesus, we say. And when he comes in to our hearts, he is born inside of us. We conceive him. He becomes, he is the new life. A new life has started growing in us the moment we receive him into our heart that's our womb of the spirit if you would in other words okay when we believe god's word mix it with faith jesus is born in us we're born of god god and man are both triune beings very similar we're made in his image he was our father we're his children god is father son holy spirit man is spirit soul and body. There's three in one, you could say. Matthew 28, 19, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord, and the Lord will cause it to come to pass. Like that. Jesus is 100% God. He is 100% man. He's not half and half. He is 100%. He referred to himself as the Son of Man until after he was born again or until after his resurrection. After that, he referred to himself as the Son of God now. So the Son, the son of Man was born again as the Son of God. The Son of God. Do you see this? Wow. So man, man is two beings in one. He is a human being and also a spirit being. And I mentioned this last week. Sandy, thanks for uh, helping me out with this, <laughs> giving me a simpler way to put it. Human birth begins human life. And spiritual birth begins spiritual life or salvation. Jesus said you have to be born two times. So man has to have a he has to have two births, one for each being, you could say. His human birth, also his spiritual birth. So he has to have two births, one for each being. Think of it that way. Children could get this in five seconds. Theologians still can't figure it out. Okay, part four we looked at. Spiritual things versus material things, or the material world versus the spiritual world. The Holy Spirit regenerates or recreates or makes alive again the lost spirit in man through faith in Jesus Christ. Every baby when they are conceived, are conceived with innocent status, meaning they are not accountable for their own soul. They are not capable of even comprehending such a concept. But their state of being is innocence. The innocent are saved. No innocent can be lost. There is no such thing as a place. 
called limbo or any other thing. This does not exist. This is a lie. There is no place for innocent babies held. There is no need for a place such as this. This is incomprehensible to anyone who has the simplest, simplest notion of what the gospel of Jesus is about. Babies are innocent. All babies. Every baby who has lost its life tragically by any means, intentional or otherwise, <coughs> through the abortion industry or through sickness or disease or whatever reason, is, a, is immediately in heaven. Hallelujah. When their spirit leaves, they there. They there then. You don't need to go somewhere else. This is a racket and a scheme and nothing more. I don't mean to hurt your feelings. I mean to tear you apart on this. This is a horrible thing to enslave people on this. I've had people come to me crying, worried about their lost babies because the priest was out of town when their baby died and couldn't get it baptized and they couldn't do this. And that. Who, who on, I don't want to give account for that. What in the world are we using for brains? You'll never get this from the Spirit of God. You'll never get it from anyone who knows God. You'll only get this from people in, with religious indoctrination. This is a horrible, what's the word they use now? Misinformation, disinformation. No, no, no. It's a total fraud. It's a scam. It's a racket. There's no bigger racket than this. Save your money. You're not going to pay the ransom nobody out of nowhere. If they didn't make it to heaven when they left here, <laughs> save your money. And you don't have to worry about anybody being in the wrong place because God is the only judge and He never makes a mistake and every judgment by God is perfect and nobody makes that call but Him. Amen. That's the way it works. It's airtight. Now, whatever I was talking about, let me see if I can get back. <laughs> The spirit in man is made alive again. He's born. When the baby's conceived, that's what it was. That baby eventually will reach an age where it needs a savior because its spirit is no longer innocent. Innocence is lost over time. Adam and Eve lost their innocence. They weren't born again. They were just made. What they lost was their innocence. Their state of preservation. They were saved by their innocence. They knew nothing of sin. They had no part in it. It had not touched them. They had not touched it. But when they did, they were dead. That's the fall. So, but every baby at some point will get older and will reach an age of accountability and will become an adult and must be born again. Period. Every person, no exception. There's no blue blood here. So the Spirit of God, when a man receives Christ, regenerates that Spirit which was born in him in need of a Savior. He now has been provided with the Savior in his heart based on his faith in Jesus Christ. When he says yes to Jesus, Jesus comes into his spirit, the spirit of Jesus, and his spirit is reborn. He is now saved. He is a Christian. Then and only then is man able to understand the scriptures. The man without the spirit has no idea of any spiritual truth whatsoever. I say it this way all the time. Anybody who can read can tell you what the Bible says. But no one can tell you what the Bible means who does not have the Holy Spirit 
And I mean there's not one exception anywhere. The natural man cannot even conceive of the concept of a God or the spiritual or the supernatural. He may feign that he does. He may pretend that he does. But he simply does not. He has no idea what he's talking about and has no idea that he has no idea. But the simplest Christian, their eyes are open and they see all, they see all the way into heaven by the Spirit of God. That's what, that's what the Scripture is talking about. When Jesus said, of those, of, of those born of women, of every natural born person in the world, of all them, none is greater than John the Baptist. But John the Baptist, but the least in the kingdom of heaven, is greater than John the Baptist. Amen. The least Christian has an open sky to God, to heaven, to revelations that can only come from Him. The most brilliant person on the planet who does not have the Spirit of God has no idea of the reality of God. The heavens are brassed over for them. You have to have the Spirit of God to understand the Scriptures, period, period. It's a must. Okay. So, then you understand the Scripture. Jesus said that, Luke 24, 45. Disappointments in this life remind us to hold fast to eternal things that never disappoint. And it also reminds us to use better judgment in the future. I think that's a good word. So in the book of Ecclesiastes, we, we spoke about it just a little. Solomon, of course, is the author. He's the son of David. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon had become very cynical and negative on life itself. And we would probably say depressed or despondent. He was burnt out, whatever term you want to call it. He's the king. He had turned his eyes away from the eternal things and focused only on the material things around him. If all you do is look around at other people and at circumstances, you're going to be one miserable person. This is what this was Solomon's mistake. He had the best. He was the king. He's the richest man ever, the wisest man ever, on and on and on. He had the best and the most beautiful of everything that anybody had ever had. Nobody could compare. Not enough. And yet it was not enough. He was not satisfied. There's always you, you can't get enough. Without God. Without a spiritual perspective, there's not enough of anything to fill that void in your life. That's the real message. So Ecclesiastes chapter 1, I want to read that uh, to you. Bear with me just a second. Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Uh, I just want to read verse 1, or maybe just a couple here. I don't want to read the whole chapter. That's not what I meant. These are the words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Futility of futilities, or vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Futility of futilities, everything is futile. What does a man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and sets. It hurries back to where it, ra where it rises. The wind blows south, then north, and then it swirls around and returns back. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea 
is never full to the place from which the streams come there again they flow in other words life is just a cycle you just go round and round and you go nowhere it's like being on a treadmill you you just spend a lot of energy and you, and you, you end up right back where you started you're in the same place so he life is no matter what you do it's all in vain it's almost like he's saying it's almost like he's saying why bother to even try why why even bother to live if you're just going to die in the end anyway what's the use why bother why struggle do you see do you do you see the state of mind that he's in oh this this is terrible this is terrible but here's the reason for this in this book here there's 12 chapters i think in ecclesiastes the word vanity or futility vanity means meaningless it's for nothing you wasted your time you wasted your life on these labors whatever you were invested in the word vanity was used 36 times and then the phrase under the sun 29 times this is the clue this is this is solomon's problem everything is meaningless to him everything is in vain because everything in this life he ends up losing one way or another and he's he's in this dark deep hole that and it can never change and there's nothing but this and what's the point utter utter meaningless vanity of vanities woe is me solomon had turned his eyes away from the spiritual if anybody had spiritual heritage solomon did his father was king david this is the blood of jesus the bloodline of jesus himself but solomon had turned away from his spiritual heritage the things that he knew and had been, and, and were in his blood the eternal things and he focused now he's hung up he's stuck we call it only on the things under the sun or the things in the world the natural things of time and distance and the natural environment in uh, of the things under the sun in the temporary material world he found no satisfaction despite all of his riches and all of his privileges there was no lasting satisfaction everything that he became fond of if he either became disillusioned with it or he ended up losing it he it lost its glamour or it rusted or it died or it withered or something happened he wanted his satisfaction was always temporary he was expecting eternal satisfaction from temporary things it doesn't work that way if we look to temporary material things for lasting satisfaction we'll become disillusioned and cynical but if we turn to the eternal word of god to the scriptures we'll find our satisfaction there this is what we'll see everything is beautiful in its time but only in its time it's all temporary it doesn't last everything in this world this everything in this world including this world itself is temporary and dated and will not be here one day so the ultimate satisfaction of man this is where i think we stopped last week the born again person the christian the believer the one who you know is, follows jesus the born again person is subjected to an ongoing inner struggle his reborn spirit desires god and spiritual things but he may still crave material things now i want to be real emphatic about this we're not talking evil things we're not saying material things are evil we're saying what jesus said in so many different ways whatever has your heart is your god 
What's the most important thing in your life, in your world? What do you spend the most time on? What do you love the most? What's the highest priority? What do you do above all things when you can do what you want to do? These things, this is what we're talking about. It's a struggle and it's a process. When we first come to the Lord, we're, uh, you know, we have baggage, <laughs> to say, to, be, to put it politely. But there's a process that begins too, and it doesn't take forever. Spiritual maturity develops as our priorities gradually transition away from material things to spiritual things. Now, you may be richer than Solomon and have more stuff than he has, and yet God may be the apple of your eye, and you may love God above all things, and everything that you have, you just see as a tool for God. Or you may fall like Solomon did and begin to look at these things and think this is all there is. I don't get any satisfaction out of this. You're not supposed to. It's not made for that. It's like, uh, you know, it's like the saying, I know it's a little bit corny, but, you know, it's, it, I think it goes like, you know, money is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's one thing owning a house, it's another thing the house owning you. I don't want to be owned by anything but, but God, that's it. But spiritual maturity develops. It's a growth process. It begins at new birth, and gradually, little by little, priorities change. The things, and it's not that they're evil necessarily and so forth, that, but they're, it's really, the way I would describe it is this. When you first get saved, you have a certain lifestyle, whatever you do. If you golf on Sunday or if you go fishing on Sunday or whatever you do, you will start, it's not that all of a sudden this will seem evil to you, but there will be newer, different desires start to grow in you. And at some point, a desire to go to church on Sunday will become a little more uh, yeah, prevalent in your life. And eventually, you know, if you follow through with that, which you ought to, if, you're in, if you have good sense, you will. <laughs> that will become your highest priority, period. Not that there aren't exceptions, but the rule is Sunday morning, I don't have to wonder what I'm doing today. All I need to know is what day it is, that's all. If you give me a watch and a calendar, my life is perfect, perfect order. I, I don't know what people, I don't know why they have a problem with that. But priorities change. And it's because greater desires overcome lesser desires. It's about desire. A long time ago when I was in my 20s, I, want, I, I tell this story all the time. It, it, I think it's relevant. I think it makes a good illustration. I wanted to uh, I wanted to pick up jogging. It was a big rage then. And, you know, running and that kind of thing. And I read this one book. I know I've told this. It's called Running for Your Life. And it's about this guy who's a big runner and he ran all of his life. Such an inspiring book. He ran through Death Valley, across Australia, all kinds of stuff. He's a runner. Well, I didn't have illusions about that but he inspired me to want to take up running. However, at that time, I smoked cigars about this long. <laughs> and, and I smoked probably 10 a day. I never let one go out and I inhaled every breath. <laughs> so I smoked, but I wanted to jog. <laughs> and I could not envision for the life of me <laughs> jogging down the roads. <laughs> Puffing away. <laughs> I know people told me, oh, I know so-and-so. And I know people do, and by all means, keep jogging. Eventually, the jogging will win out. So don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I loved smoking. But I started to love the idea of running. And then the more I read, 
the more I heard about how bad smoking was and about how good exercise was, faith comes by hearing, doesn't it? Yep. So I heard all that. And at some point, faith came. And all of a sudden now, faith comes by hearing and faith and nothing else but faith brings conversion. Faith will change you. When I reached that level of faith where the light went on, I was changed. I never smoked again and I ran my whole adult life. And now I walk even. It's just, you know, a lesser form of running. But that never left me. That never left me. But the, the law is, and this is a law, the greater desire always wins out. So the key is to nurture the right desires. Don't do stupid stuff. It only makes you want to do more stupid stuff. It's like eating sugar. The more you eat, the more you want to eat of it. It's, it's counterproductive. Do things... Do things that you know are good for you because you heard it. And faith came and you started doing it. And when you started doing it, it started growing. Your greater desire overcomes the lesser des the, uh, desire. So my desire at, one, at some point became greater for running than it did for smoking. And when that happened, I smoked my last. That was it. That was 40-some uh, years ago. The greater desire always wins out, no matter what. This is a law, this is a fundamental law of human nature, and there are no exceptions. Every one of us right now as we sit here are doing the very thing that we wanted to do the most among all the options we had available to us. We chose this because this is what we wanted to do more than the other things that we might have been doing instead. Whatever we want to do the most, we will always do, period. The reason people don't go to church on Sunday, they don't want to. All that lame stuff, well, I got this and that. No, that's a lie. They're liars. They're just like every other man. But the truth is, whatever you want to do, you will find a way to do it. If you make worship, the highest priority in your life, those other things will somehow work themselves out. You'll be able to get the grass cut too. But if your yard is a higher priority, you'll never find time for worship. It'll never be there. It's not extra time that you go do it. The important things in life have to be built in. They cannot be added on. They cannot be. The greater desire always wins out. So the priorities are what direct the course of our life. Spiritual maturity develops as our priorities gradually transition away from material things to spiritual things. Desire. What is the scripture text? I forget Psalm 37 maybe. I'm not sure on the text. But... Uh, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desire of your heart. So when you delight yourself in the Lord, you will have a, delight, you will have a heart that delights in the things of the Lord and He's more than happy to give you those things. But it's your heart's desire. <clears throat> when you desire wrong things, your, even your earthly father, if he's normal, will not give you those things. So my saying is, don't get permanently attached to temporary things. You're going to be terribly heartbroken. As we understand more of God's Word in our studies, like here tonight, our renewed spirit becomes liberated from the materialistic things of time and the natural world around us and finds its true home, our spirit does, in the eternal spiritual realm will find that desire to, to go and read the Bible, to, to go watch something spiritual on TV or radio or a book 
our desire, it just changes. And I'm telling you right now, there is not but one thing, not but one, that can change human nature. And that is the gospel of Jesus Christ when they are born again. The new birth is the only thing that will change a man. Man can try to change, but he cannot change. The Bible says, can a leopard change his spots? He cannot. He's a leopard. He's born a leopard. He'll die a leopard. That which is crooked cannot be made straight by any means. There is not but one hope for man. It's not more of this. It's not more of that. It's not read this and read that. He must be reborn by the Spirit of God. And only then is a new creature moved into that, into that human body to begin a whole new life. If any man be in Christ who is a new creature, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new, and all these things are from God. The difference, and the only thing that matters, and the only thing worth arguing about, is that does your, has your religion changed your life? If your religion hasn't changed you, you need to change your religion. You can just take up religion, join churches, become members of different denominations or different religions until you're dead and lost. But until you're born again, you will never belong to the family of God. Period. Only the Spirit of God can change the nature of a man. He can take a murderer and make a babysitter out of him. He can make a thief and make a security guard out of him. He can take just a pure, you know, drug addict and make a preacher out of him. No program can do that. No program. Only a person. Jesus Christ, the only one. We stand alone as a city on a hill. That we are the only ones that have the message, that we have the solution. We have the answer to the needs everywhere. Political, social, you name it. The answer is Jesus Christ. And there is no other answer. No matter how many you pile on, it's all for naught. It's as Solomon said, it's vanity of vanities. It's all futility. It's all meaningless. It will all fail and leave people laying in the dust. They will everyone die trying. Except they're born again. They cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Period. Amen. Amen. So, as we understand we're, we're more and more of the Bible, we are liberated from the mindset and from the different desires that we have that think in a natural kind of way, but it's supernatural. It's the Spirit of God that just gently reshapes us and recreates us into the person that we were created or made to be, our best person. 2 Corinthians Five or four seventeen, for our present troubles are small. <laughs> I better say that again in case somebody wants to argue. <laughs> for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Remember, everything is temporary, right? Yet they do produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So the troubles are temporary and they pass. But when you yield to the Word of God and allow the Spirit to work in you, the benefits are, are immeasurable and eternal of you going through these things and following Jesus through them. This is the benefit. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen, the invisible, the spiritual things. For the things we see now will soon be gone. You know that, don't you? But the things we cannot see will last forever. The invisible precedes the visible. In the beginning, the invisible God created the visible universe. And the invisible will once again 
swallow us all up in this wonderful spiritual family, the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Oops. Now let me mess up here. When affliction comes, if we focus on the things which are seen, circumstances, we become bitter and disappointed. But if we look at the eternal things revealed in the Word of God, we're always going to come back to the Word of God. It starts and ends there. Jesus said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. He's the Word and everything in between. But if we look at the eternal things revealed in the Word of God, we will be lifted up and weaned from time to eternity. In other words, the things that we're so disappointed in, in life, and it just looks like it's like Solomon, you know, it's just like not worth living and so forth. Look at the Word of God. You'll find yourself being lifted out of the miry clay, the miry pit by the power of God. Uh, sorry, I meant to go forward there. 2 Corinthians 5, I want to turn there. Along the same uh, train of thought. Second Corinthians 5, verse 1. Now we know, now we know that if the earthly tent we live in, this is talking about the physical body, the tent is like a temporary dwelling. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is dismantled, or you know, if the body falls apart, <laughs> we have a building from God, one that will never fall apart an eternal house in heaven not built by human hands. Whether you know it or not, the tent you live in now was made by human hands, the human hands of your father and your mother who were both human, most likely. For, for in this tent we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed we will not be found naked. The word naked here means it means uncovered. When you go back to Genesis, what you find in the fall, that everything is there. Everything is there and nothing is not there. If you, have, if you have eyes to see. The word naked there means uncovered. Uncovered means without cover. Cover is the root word of covenant. So God had a covenant with man with Adam. He said to the man, you may eat freely of any tree in the garden except the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. So we have a covenant. As long as you eat here, he said, his opening statement was, every tree in the garden is good for for food for fruit it's good for you it's good except the one so you're free you may eat freely of every tree of the garden except this one this is the covenant as long as you do that nothing can hurt you nothing can harm you you live forever this is paradise this is the garden of eden trust me but if you eat from this tree here, the day you do, you shall surely die. So when he did, he broke the covenant. He broke the covenant. He now has no covenant. The covenant that God made with him was the covenant of eternal life. As long as you live in the domain, the realm, the dimension, that you were created to live in, it's like saying to a fish, as long as you live in the pond, you're gonna do well, but if you try to live out on the, in the grass, you're gonna die. This is exactly the case. 
So they, when he broke covenant with God, he had no protection. He had no cover. So now he's, he's, he's exposed. There's no cover. He's naked. And now he's vulnerable. And everything, the, the serpent and all that comes with him, all of this is just eat him up now. And the world just eats him up. He has no covenant. That's what naked means. So this is, this is what we have. We have the new covenant. In his blood, Jesus said. This covenant gives us cover. It gives us cover. If any man sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You have been covered in his blood. No matter what you do, you're in covenant. And no one in covenant can be snatched from his hand. No one can perish who is in covenant with God. Do you see what I'm saying? This is so important. For in this uh, verse 3, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. So while we're in this tent, in this body, we groan under our burden. Sometimes it's tough. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but clothed so that our mortality, mortality just means death. So our death may be swallowed up by life. So even your death is covered. There's a new life. There's, it's not over. It's just beginning. And God has prepared us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, as a pledge or guarantee of what is to come. So He gave us this and promised there's more to come. What did He give us? The Spirit. The Spirit of God. Verse 6, Therefore we are always confident, although we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. I think the King James says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You don't leave here and go there like it's a long trip. One or the other. You are absent here, present there. It's the same thing. You are just there. There's no time in between. Time is not relevant to eternal things, right? right. The Spirit is eternal, right? And not affected by time. So you can't measure the distance or the time of leaving and going to heaven. Verse uh, 6, verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, that doesn't mean we walk by wishful thinking or we're hoping something turns out to be true in the end, but we're not sure. Walking by faith means we walk by what we believe in. There's not a person on earth who walks who does not who walks any other way except by faith. Everyone walks by faith. Everyone walks according to what they believe themselves. There are many who believe they can just walk the way they're walking and still make it okay in the end, but maybe not. We believe in all that the Lord has given us to believe. We walk not on what we feel, not on what we think, what we know to be true based on the Word of God. We walk by faith, faith in the Son of God. Not by sight, not by feelings, but by what's written in the Word of God. We are confident then and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we aspire to please Him whether we are here in this body or away from it. Okay, that's enough of that. So the pledge, the word pledge is used here. Pledge is a Semitic word or Jewish word found in the Hebrew language, Arabic language, Greek language, even in Swahili. It means a down payment. A pledge is a down payment or an earnest deposit in real estate. If you're buying a house or selling a house or whatever, you want to make, you want to buy this house. You say, "I like this house. I want to buy it." Here, I'm writing you a check as a deposit. This is a earnest deposit. So you write the check, whatever it is, five thousand or ten or three or whatever you do. This is your earnest deposit. When you do that, you are promising, guaranteeing that you will come back with the rest of the money later and make the full purchase. 
and the person who accepts this deposit agrees that this will be reserved for you until you return. So it's pretty simple, isn't it? This is, the, this is what the Holy Spirit is in us. The pledge reserves ownership of something pending payment in full at a later date. The Holy Spirit in us is God's guarantee or pledge that He's coming back for us with the rest of the payment. Okay, now what could that be? Why was he? Was it? What he coming? Was he coming back? What's going? What does that mean? He's already paid for us with his own blood. We're already redeemed. We are the redeemed of the Lord now, not later on, not in the future, but now. So what's the rest of it? What's what's he's bringing something? What what's the rest? What else is left? Well, our spirit's already reborn, isn't it? Our mind or our soul is being renewed now while we're in this class here tonight. We're learning and growing. So what's left? The body, the resurrection of the body. That's what he's coming back for. He's coming back. He promised, you know, every time we do communion, we're going to do it this Sunday. Remember, he said, do this in remembrance of me until I come. So what's, there's not but one thing left. You are... Let me put it this way to keep it in simple terms. Man is three parts, spirit, soul, and body. The spirit is already saved the moment you give your life to Jesus. It's as saved as it will ever be a million years from now. It won't be more saved than now. If you're already in heaven now, you wouldn't be more saved than you are sitting here in this classroom. You are saved entirely by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now your spirit is already saved. It has been saved. Your soul is being saved, renewed now, growing, learning, maturing, developing. The soul is being saved presently, not past. The spirit was saved in your past. When you first believed, you were saved in your past now you are in your present being saved in your soul you will yet be saved later in your body at the resurrection this is what he has guaranteed that will happen later he give us he gave us the holy spirit as the deposit to certify the pledge that he will come again and receive us unto himself. And when he comes again, then our body will be fully redeemed and we are entirely now saved. We're spirit, soul, body remaining. Then the body will be saved too. We'll be saved spirit, soul, and body at his return. That's what he's bringing with him when he returns. Meanwhile, we are set apart to him for his purposes now while he's here we're not available for any other purpose he has his deposit on us we cannot be sold we cannot be we cannot belong to another That's right. he's already made a deposit you go to buy a car you put the deposit on you can't sell it to the next guy you got a problem you're gonna have some real problems you got the, the deposit is a legal binding covenant this must be held for the one who made the pledge. As long as the one comes when the time he said he would with what he said he would come with, then that car will, will be completely his. The title will belong to him. He cannot sell that car to anyone else. The deposit has guaranteed it. And the deposit in us is this spirit that we have now that we're teaching and learning and listening and hearing by Psalm 17, 15, as for me, oh, I see we're out of time. Psalm 17, 15, as for me, I shall behold thy face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with thy likeness when I wake. It's just a beautiful psalm to close with that uh, the psalmist is saying, when I see him, when I behold his face, 
I will be satisfied. What's the name of this last lesson here? The ultimate satisfaction of man. So we'll pick up there next week. And uh, God bless you and thank you for coming out. And we'll see you this Sunday. Uh, first Sunday in December, we'll have a communion. Looking forward to seeing everyone 11 o'clock Sunday morning. God bless you and thank you for coming.